that's the opening. I want that section to go into there. We got plenty of material by the time I squeeze this together. In one of my recent videos, Philip Ponsela has demonstrated the double cleft weld in order to, to do the weld that actually keeps itself together. Another version, of course, is the scarf weld you put together and then you forge that out. That is how typically tongs are made. You, uh, you scarf weld on a pair of uh, O-rings. I want to do the application with the double cleft weld. Weld on reins to a pair of tongs. For the reins, I'm going to use mild steel and the length that I got right here, how much have I taken? I don't even know that. I've taken... Uh, about 30 centimeters, slightly over 30 and a half centimeters. So we are looking at, oh, that's not too bad, it's 12 inches. So this is 3 8 10 millimeters round, 10 millimeters round bar, just mild steel, no iron. And what I got here is some rebar. This is uh, about three quarter inch rebar, about 20 mil reinforcement bar that I'm going to use. We're going to use that for the jaws and everything and then a little bit below that we're going to cut that off and then we're going to forge weld on the rain. Of course you can draw out the rain. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to that. If you draw out the rain and you draw it out by hand and you can only use the anvil it depends on your skill level and, and the time you do it, how well finished the reins are. And the rougher the reins are, the rougher they are on your hands. Whereas if you can keep the heat localized, you can do a good preparation on this. You can weld on these reins. They won't be as springy, but at least the reins, they will be smooth and they will be soothing your hands. Whereas if you got a roughly drawn out crusty rain that you got to work with that is rough on your hands so it's it, it, it depends on what you want to do in any case we're going to forge weld mild steel to rebar the first thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to upset this to the amount of material that i think is enough for that double cleft weld and then i'm going to forge the pair of tongs because that scarf preparation the entire preparation of that is going to depend on this size. If I do it the other way around and make the tong half first and uh, leave the material in that, it's going to be, if I do it too much, if I leave too much material in that, I'm going to have to upset this very much, whereas I want it to be the other way around. This is going to be the thinnest one and I want the tong half to match that, not the other way around. It's going to be easier to match uh, the tong half to this because that material I can draw out. Whereas upsetting take, takes a bit more effort. What is the advantage of this weld? If you do a scarf weld, a, a normal lap scarf weld, you have to come out of the you come out of the fire. You got to be quick or quick enough. You got to line them out. You got to do it correctly, without that twisting and everything. You got to hit it and then set that weld. The advantage of this double cleft is that you can attach them, put them in the fire, bring them up to a welding heat, and forge weld them together. Then, so you don't have to do this this crucial alignment that that you know it, it it takes that out Another way to upset is in the vise.
Okay, this should be enough of an upset. I got enough material behind it. So what I can do now is I can actually start flattening it and turn it into a flat taper. That will put it flat on the anvil. And that means I can also more easily cut it, which is what we're uh, gonna do next. I'm not gonna continue after uh, I've pointed this, then I'm gonna start with the tongs because I want that scarf preparation to match with the tong halves. If I do everything right now and, and cut everything prepared, I got nothing to compare it against to anymore. So it's important that I taper it, leave that as is, and then work on the tongs. Again, trying to make that sort of screwdriver. Let's not go overboard. I'm gonna go with, oh, what would be enough? Three centimeters. So about one and a quarter inch or so. Line it up. And we're gonna draw that. This new old anvil does throw me off a little bit because this anvil, it is still quite crowned. You, you can probably, yeah, you should be able to see that on camera. It is a bit round. Not that the edge has been hammered down that much, but that thing actually crowns. So when I want to be square, I don't have to be, you know, I got to be more like that to be square with that edge, to have that line up. So, uh, but that takes uh, some, uh, some getting used to. So if you see some weird stuff, uh, it, it is throwing me off because I'm not used to the crowned anvil. Or, you know, uh, put into other words, uh, lack of skills. Don't go further than halfway. Now I gotta go to the other side and move the camera. About that much, you don't have to go much further than that. The next thing that I can then do with this pair of tongs is I need to work the boss a little bit so I can come in here, upset the boss. And the other thing that I can do is give myself a little bit more length in that area. Keep it there. I'm going to turn it. Straighten it up. All right, I'm going to leave that be. That's fine. I want to leave that thickness in there because I'm still going to do some forge welding. It usually is a bit easier if you bend it you don't have to come as close to the anvil. Okay, flatten it. That's off camera, unfortunately. You can come back. Flatten it a little bit, make it a bit nicer, not too nice. And leave that for what it is. No cleaning up until after the forge welding. So what I can do now is simply cut it off. Okay, cut it off right behind that transition. Don't cut all the way and simply break it off. Clean this up. I do miss the offsetting block. I would like to do that, but I don't have that on this anvil. 
So I gotta stand it up. That's why an upsetting block is so much nicer. You got it, because you can actually stand it down. Okay, now we've got to match the other preparation. There is a size difference, but that should work out because this material needs to be drawn out anyway. And this is far enough behind it that I think it should work fine. Because we have that extra thickness in there. Alright, then it's time to, uh, to cut them open. And what Philip did is he cut them straight above. So you have like a straight cut on the inside. There was someone that commented, shouldn't you cut them on the flats so that you get like a sort of triangle on the inside. And that's what I'm going to try. I'm going to do that. Give that a shot. All right, I'm just going to try and lay out, see if I can keep it sort in the middle. And if I don't, well, too bad. I'm starting on the difficult side first. Because then the other side is going to be easier. on the difficult side. It's almost like punching a hole. And then we flip it over. Now we're on the easy side. And I can do a similar thing, mark it out for the next cut. See if it can be sorted in the middle. If I can manage that. Continue with that one. It doesn't have to be a brilliant cut. Of course, if you want that, you can do that. Try and not hit the anvil. Now they need to be split, so I'm taking a blunt hardy rather than the narrow one. All right, set it on the hardy. It's not made for this anvil, but it will work. bit more triangular on the inside to help push out the dirt. It's not perfect, but any angle will do. Anything that is not flat. And yeah, there's a bit of that rag in there, but now at least we have something that could interlock. Similar idea, try and aim for the middle if I can. Oh, come on, you. Cut almost all the way through. Got to thin down this one a little bit more. Flip it over. And then try and make it split without drop forging it. Oh, 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 don't drop forge it. And with this turning, a little bit difficult, maybe I can lift it up, put a little bit of material underneath it to counteract that.
nearly through. And it has pretty much split almost all the way. Like so. The rest I'll do on the cut of Hardy. Okay, split this guy. Okay, I gotta bend him in a little bit. So it can grab the other one. Because you want them to slide over each other. Same with this guy. That's probably close enough. Okay, now I'm going to do some sliding action. That's ah, too close, but maybe I can force it. Doesn't help that the hardy tool is not made for this. And then slightly under tension. Now that's going to jump it up. Then I'm going to use the hardy hole itself. Now that they're like that, then I can push them in under tension. All right, so now I'm sure of that. Now I know what to do. Now I've learned that you put them on a tension like that. And now I don't really want to push this down again because that's going to open it up. So I'm going to leave it as is. And what I would like to do at this stage then, I'll use two fluxes or two things to forge well with. I'll use borax on this one and on the other one I'll use sand. That's the tack weld. Okay, you're nearly one heat. I want to take another heat to, to be able to blend this and everything in. There you go. You know, this stuff costs money, so only cut from the one side. Let's see, you gotta be about there or so ish. So like that, just one heat, that will split. Time to open it up. Just 
Weer terug nog. Ja, die is denk ik achter. Okay. De tuin. A bit uneven. I don't think it's going to matter that much. Just like that. So it's a slight variation. It's not exactly like that double cleft wall where they are flat and they grab together. No, it's sort of like a combination of a uh, V-weld where you fill up the groove and the cleft. Actually you got the two together right now. That's the opening, I want that section to go into there. Now they're sticking together, that's good. They're holding. And I can bring it up. And slide them in and put them under tension. So what we got with this guy, we got plenty of material by the time I squeeze this together. And you got that sort of V-weld and cleft weld thing going on here. Uh, not cut as deep, not as much work in it with, with, with filling around and, and trying to do the fit up. And not as much of an overlap where we can see that difference. Um, I'm going to be really curious to see what this does with, uh, with sand. And the thing with sand is... It's a bit like with scale, if you do throw on the sand, you want to throw that on in the fire uh, when it's a bit beyond the yellow heat, it's got to be really warm. Borax you can throw on at a really light heat, you know, about red heat and it already starts to melt. If you do that with sand, it doesn't work. You have to apply that when it is well hot, not too hot. And you'll see a, a bit more sparks coming off of it than with the borax, because the borax you can lower the temperature a bit more, whereas with the sand you need to go slightly higher in temperature otherwise it, it doesn't work with sand you cannot weld too cold with sand so uh, let's give that a shot all right that should be tacked on right now now i can take a full welding heat and weld it shut Alright, let's take another heat to clean that up. <laughs> 